Welcome to Fertility Friendly Food, the podcast. My name is Stephanie Vlakis and I'm an expert certified fertility dietitian and nutritionist and founder of The Dietologist, a multiple award winning virtual fertility and pregnancy nutrition clinic serving thousands from around the world. And of course, the host of this pod, Fertility Friendly Food. This podcast is dedicated to all things health and nutrition in the world of fertility, reproductive health, and pregnancy. Each week, I bring you practical snack size episodes to help improve your lifestyle on your trying to conceive journey, alongside guest expert interviews to help inspire you to learn and grow whilst you grow your family. Welcome back. I am back with the solo episode today as we hurtle towards the end of 2023 and also season four of this podcast, which is starting to draw to a close. Can hardly believe it. So for today's episode, I wanted to create almost a little audio guide for those of you who are trying to conceive in your 30s with the key information you need, including the stats and facts, modifiable factors, and of course, some nutrition and lifestyle foundations to support your family growing goals. Of course, I will be following up for trying to conceive in your 40s next week. You have not been forgotten because almost 100% of you listening and following us on Instagram are female. I'm going to focus on female fertility. However, I will say that male fertility is impacted by age too. And I think that is an important discussion to have. But for the sake of this podcast episode, I'm just going to be focusing on female fertility. Otherwise, it would be a very, 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 very long episode. Quick content and trigger warning. Today's episode does contain discussion regarding pregnancy loss. If you would prefer not to hear this content at the moment, please protect your heart and skip to another episode and reach out to the Pink Elephant Support Network. The link is in our show notes and sending you lots of love. So let's start with some stats. Did you know that in Australia, as of 2020, over 53% of first-time mothers are aged 30 years and over? This is compared to 15% before 1981, 23% in 1991, and 43% in 2011. So safe to say women are older when they become first-time parents in Australia. And I would imagine these trends would be mimicked in many similar societies all over the world. I would imagine similar in the US, Canada, uh, the UK, parts of Europe, and so on. And for those aged in the 35 to 39 year old bracket, in 2020, the stat is about 14% will be first time mothers in that age range, which is up from just 4.5% in 1991. So a huge growth of women between 35 and 39 becoming first time mothers over the last few decades. We talk about it a lot in the media. The increase in age in becoming a parent is due to a variety of factors like longer educations, career, the desire to have financial stability and security before having children, other factors that may be less in our control, like finding the right partner to have a child with, relationships not working out. And let's not forget the absurdity of things like the housing market, cost of living. Uh, Here in Australia, especially the eastern states, a housing market is just bonkers and a lot of people want to have a home that is their own before they become a parent and so that is getting delayed as well. So I think this all has a role to play. Sadly, as most of you know, our biology does not care about the price of houses and as we enter this decade of our 30s, our fertility rates do change throughout this decade. So I am going to walk you through some of the stats, not to scare you, not to instill fear in your hearts, but really to just give you the statistics and then give you some of the reasons why and some positive actions that you can take. So our chances of pregnancy does shift from our 20s to 30s. So let's recap some of the stats for completeness. Chance of unassisted conception on any given month at around age 25 is about 25%. So that's you have a 25% chance of getting pregnant if you are having unprotected sex in any given month when you're around the age of 25. Obviously, things like optimal timing, medical concerns and so on aside that on average, it's about 25%. By age 30, this drops to about 20%. 
and by age 35, this drops to about 15%. So whilst there is a steady decline, the concept that your fertility just dives off a cliff the day of your 35th birthday is probably an over-dramatization to spur people into action. Now, action is important, especially if you absolutely know you want to have children or you know you want to have the option to have children one day then yes, you need to really think about your options like egg or embryo freezing, solo motherhood by choice, or evaluating other options with your fertility specialist. Why does age matter so much for the fertility of females? There's a few key reasons why. Number one, we are born with all the eggs we will ever have. We carry them from 20 weeks in our mum's tummies through to today, which means to a degree, the eggs will be exposed to all the different things that life throws at you. Your partying days at uni, crappy diet at times in your teenage or early adulthood years, all sorts of things. And so, you know, we don't get that opportunity to hit refresh on our gametes, which are 50% of our future child's DNA, unlike men where the sperm health care can somewhat uh, regenerate itself every few months. So they've got that clean slate, so to speak, in many cases. The next point is that 20% of all human eggs are aneuploid. That means they do not have the right number of chromosomes. They don't have the right number of chromosomes. They fertilize, they implant. The chance of this uh, aneuploid egg becoming a pregnancy that you deliver is quite low. Your risk of miscarriage is very high. As we get older, the ratio of these aneuploid eggs rises relative to the euploid or chromosomally normal eggs. This means as we age, the risk of miscarriage increases. The risk is about 15% for women aged 30 to 34 and jumps up to 25% in women aged 35 to 39. The third point is, in addition, the number of eggs decline as we age, and this speeds up as we approach our late 30s. But egg number is not all that relevant when it comes to predicting your chances of conception and having a healthy pregnancy. Rather, the health of the egg and the genetics of the egg is key. So you're thinking, great, so how do I make these chromosomally abnormal eggs, well, normal? Sadly, you can't. So it becomes a situation of striving to continue trying until you find that golden egg, so to speak. Keep in mind, these errors are random. These genetic errors are just random. So we can't test for them preconceptionally like you would in preconception genetic carrier screening that you may have been recommended. That is looking at whether you carry any genes that you and your conception partner could then pass on to your child, which may impact their life and the health of your pregnancy potentially as well. So some common ones include cystic fibrosis, fragile X syndrome, or spinal muscular atrophy. And we are pretty close now to having Medicare funding for this in Australia to have those three genes tested, but you can privately arrange for a more expansive panel to be done privately. And some companies do offer this with a simple saliva a test at home. It is now a universal recommendation that all hopeful parents should undergo preconception genetic carrier screening prior to trying to conceive and to make informed decisions if they carry any of those genes uh, with a genetic counsellor, which may also mean skipping straight to IVF to select a unaffected embryo. So now that you know the facts and some of them may have startled you, which isn't my intention here, knowledge is power. And I am trying to lay the groundwork to give you some insights into what you can be doing, because I know in the media, this is often where the conversation stops. And then there's just calls to action of people to think about having babies sooner. And, and, you know, there's never a perfect time. And, and all of that is valid rhetoric. But I feel for a lot of women and a lot of women I encounter in virtual clinic that this is actually not all that helpful. And instead they find the discussion I'm about to have with you much more helpful. So what can't we change? We can't change our age and the age of your conception partner if you have one. We have no time machines here to reverse age us. I can't change your family history, your underlying genetic code or what genes you may carry but we can change how some genes are expressed via the environment. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, Your medical history, 
As we get older, some medical conditions like endometriosis and adenomyosis, which are progressive in nature, do worsen. Uh, We have a higher diagnostic rate of autoimmune diseases. We know that women in that middle age category are much more likely to be diagnosed with autoimmune conditions, which may affect fertility. And some conditions that are associated with lifestyle are actually more likely to occur in general. So things like diabetes and all those things can impact fertility. So let's focus now on what we can change. We can focus on diet and nutrition, physical activity, environmental exposures like endocrine disrupting chemicals or EDCs for short, smoking and alcohol intake, and drug use, and obviously avoiding the latter three. So here are my tips as a fertility dietitian to help support you trying to conceive in your 30s. Number one is to get your preconception lab work done with your GP before you even start trying. Yes, before you even start trying, you can book an appointment and have a discussion and they will send you for lab work before you even start trying to identify if there's any obvious barriers and to ensure that your preconception period, that there's no barriers to healthy conception or a healthy pregnancy. Number two is to know your timelines. If you're trying to conceive under the age of 35, technically you've got 12 months of unassisted conception before seeking expert fertility specialist advice. However, if you feel that something is not right, your period is painful, irregular, or you have a medical history that could impact your fertility, then please seek advice anytime sooner than that before you even start trying fertility specialists are not just there to put you on a path to IVF they're actually also there to optimize unassisted conception and to provide their expertise and guidance about what you can be doing and so if any of those things apply to you don't wait till you get to 12 months if you have an inkling that something might not be right then Go and get checked out sooner rather than later. You can't get that time back. If you're over the age of 35, this time frame reduces to six months. Now, keep in mind, most specialists are going to have wait time. So give yourself at least three months prior to that cutoff to get the referral, to get the appointment set up. If you're pregnant, you can always cancel the appointment. The next thing is to know your menstrual cycle. Now, if you've not paid much attention to your periods and cycle before, then take this opportunity to get to know it better than just a little red pen squiggle in your diary. Understand the phases of the menstrual cycle and start to familiarize yourself with signs of ovulation like a thinner cervical mucus, basal body temperature rising, and LH surges, for example, and how you may be able to track this. This will then help you narrow down your fertile window to time sexual intercourse. You won't believe how many people I meet in their 30s, even their late 30s, who have just used an app and didn't realize that they were ovulating at a completely different time and they were completely missing the boat, so to speak, every month for over a year when it comes to trying to conceive. And let me tell you, there is nothing more frustrating than that. So please nail this early before you even start actively trying to conceive. Give yourself a few rounds of testing out your skills in learning to track your cycle, learning your body. I call them dummy cycles. You're going to have a few rounds of those before you actively start trying to conceive. See how accurately you can identify your fertile window. And that will really take some of the pressure off as well if you do muck it up, if you're not actively trying to conceive that month. Now, I often tell clients the older we get, the more of the one percenters we need to be on our side when trying to conceive. So here are some of the strategies that I would suggest as a starting point with diet and lifestyle. And this is not specific to a specific medical condition like PCOS or endometriosis or a thyroid condition. This is just generally speaking. If you've got one of those concerns, then of course, tailored approach is needed. And we have heaps of podcast episodes on all of those things I just mentioned as well. So the first one is to take a prenatal multivitamin with the right amount of folate and folic acid for you. And you'll probably need an omega-3 supplement too. This is for the health of your pregnancy, but may also have some benefits to your chances of conception too, according to some research like folate supplementation, for example, being one of them. The next thing is as we get older, especially over the age of 35, we do have some research around using specific antioxidants like CoQ10 or ubiquinol, which is research to be associated with enhanced embryo quality in those over the age of 35. 
Getting the right dose and form of ubiquinol for you is important. So chat to us in a prenatal supplement consult to get a complete plan. And also knowing when to stop taking it is just as important too. The next is to focus on colorful eating to max out those antioxidants to protect your precious eggs in the sprint to ovulation in that 90 to 120 day runway prior to conception. This will help protect them from any environmental damage, from toxin exposures, alcohol, and more. But note that we can't reverse an aneuploid egg to normal through diet and lifestyle. We can't make, you know, an extra chromosome disappear or grow an extra chromosome back. Uh, There are certainly limits to this. So we are talking Talking about protecting the cell health here rather than the DNA being reversed. We can also aim to protect the impact of inflammatory markers and inflammatory proteins like cytokines, and that is generally linked with more disorganized DNA in the egg. So that's another way that we can work towards improving and supporting egg health using diet and lifestyle. But no, it won't convert a a chromosomally abnormal egg to normal. The next is to boost your seafood. Couples who consume more seafood boost their ability to consume by about 61%. So aim for twice a week and prioritize oily fish species like salmon, ocean trout, sardines, and anchovies. And fun fact, the couples that had more seafood had 22% more sex than those that didn't. So there you go. The next is to minimize alcohol to as close as zero as possible. Anecdotally, I find women in their 30s are consuming a lot more alcohol than you may think. Wines with dinner, headed out with friends on the weekend, Friday after work drinks. Some of this related to work, others use it as a stress management tool. And of course, maybe you got a little bit more cash at this age than in your 20s for a nice bottle of red or whatever you like to drink. But our eggs don't love alcohol. In fact, just two standard drinks per week in some studies have been linked to an increased risk of miscarriage. We have an episode on alcohol and fertility. So tune into that one. It's linked in our show notes for you. The next one is to reduce your exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals from plastics, thermal receipts and food packaging, not to mention cleaning products, cosmetics, hair care and more. Ugh, overwhelming much. BPA, phthalates, dioxins, and more contain xenoestrogens, which can mimic our natural hormones, specifically estrogen, which can wreak havoc with our menstrual cycles and our egg health too. I'll link an episode with Lucy Lines from Two Lines Fertility that dives into this topic in a lot more depth. I promise it is not as woo as it sounds right now. My next tip is to move your body in a way that you enjoy and find the right amount of movement for you and build a routine around it. I am no exercise expert, but it's undeniable the benefits of exercise on our physical and mental health. And from a fertility standpoint, helping to get some blood flow happening and a healthy way of managing stress because trying to conceive can be stressful AF is going to benefit you. Some people definitely overdo it though. So listen to our previous episode with Courtney Pollock, accredited exercise physiologist from Her Exercise Physiology to learn more about the right amount of exercise when trying to conceive. And last but not least, this one sucks to even utter, but manage your stress. A lot of people I see are managing their stress in maybe a less than healthy coping strategy way. So some things that I commonly see is people emotionally eating, overusing exercise, drowning their sorrows in a bottle of red wine every Friday night. And these coping strategies can hurt your fertility. Stress itself, the jury is out on how it impacts conception, but naturally the more you say don't stress when you feel the pressure of the clock, the what ifs and the uncertainty of what lies ahead is really hard and often amplifies stress. So please seek some professional support. I'll link some episodes with psychologist Tanami Sonta and some other guests that we've had about stress and fertility and mental health down below for you as well. So trying to conceive in your 30s is common, and in most cases, it definitely isn't too late. Some extra TLC on the modifiable factors is definitely warranted and recommended. And if you're planning to delay your family growing for a bit, start the basics of diet and lifestyle now. So it's habitual. Chat with your doctor about your options. It might be egg freezing or solo parenthood by choice or a decision to get started before you feel 110% ready. I know, a wild thought. 
but something that Dr. Joseph Scroy, OBGYN fertility doctor in Melbourne, who always says this on his podcast, Baby Making Kid Raising with Eliza Carr, is you want to conceive when you're physically, emotionally, financially, socially, and medically ready. I hope I am not misquoting him, but it's pretty rare that all these things will all line up at the exact same time. Okay, I could go on and on, but (laughs) I think that's what our consultations are for. So if you are trying to conceive in your 30s and want professional guidance, support, and ensure you're ticking all the right boxes in anticipation of trying to conceive, by listening to this podcast, it means you're at the exact right moment to take some tangible action so you can feel confident you've done all that you can without inventing a time machine so you feel you're making positive and productive progress on your journey to expanding your family. An awesome starting point is our Fertility Nutrition Intensive. It's a two-hour one-on-one session for you and your conception partner, if you have one. Otherwise, solo mamas, you are very, very welcome. And it's an opportunity to audit your diet, lifestyle, blood work, medical history, and build a custom nutrition and supplement plan to improve your chances of conception quickly and as healthily as possible. We also give you our ultimate fertility nutrition manual as a download, which is such a handy toolbox of tips to support egg quality, sperm quality, how to build fertility-friendly meals, snack ideas, and so, so much more. And if you need more support outside the context of lifestyle, we can also point you in the right direction with other healthcare providers as you need it. The link is below for you to book in for one of these very limited two-hour slots with myself and the dietologist team, our fertility nutrition intensive, so don't miss out. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode. Don't forget to subscribe or follow on your favorite podcast streaming platform. Leave us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. It makes such a difference to our little podcast reaching more people. And don't forget to share it with your partner, friends, family member, colleague, or just to your social media friends on your stories and give us a tag at the underscore dietologist. We love to see it. Until next time, everyone. Bye. Just quickly, are you currently trying to conceive or are you on a fertility journey? If so, you can feel like there are 101 things you could or should be doing when it comes to your preconception or fertility health. It's easy to get overwhelmed really quickly. This is exactly why we created our preconception lifestyle checklist. It's one page for you and one page for your partner, categorized into supplements, diet, lifestyle and environmental factors, and we focus on the low-hanging fruit. These are simple but effective strategies known to help improve your health and well-being for fertility and also for a healthy pregnancy and a healthy baby too. Over 5,000 people have downloaded it already. Do you want your free copy too? Head to the link in the show notes now to swipe your free checklist. Okay, let's get into today's episode. Fertility Friendly Food, the podcast, acknowledges the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognizes the continuing connections to lands, waters and community. We pay our respects to First Nation cultures and to the elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all First Nations people tuning in today. This podcast is recorded on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation.